Okay. <clears throat> Welcome everybody who's starting to join us. We'll just we'll get started in a couple of minutes. There's just quite a lot of people joining. So we'll just give people a few minutes to uh, get connected and then we'll get started. For people who've just joined, I was saying we'll get started in a couple of minutes. We've just got a few more people joining us, so it won't be long. We'll be starting in about a minute. Okay, I think we will get, <clears throat> excuse me, I think we will get started because we've got quite a lot to get through and we just have one hour. <clears throat> so welcome everyone to the second in our series of Arctivism Conversations. My name is Pippa Cooper and I'm the coordinator of the Human Rights Defender Hub at the Centre for Applied Human Rights at the University of York. And early in 2020, not long after the lockdown began, the Hub issued a call for Arctivists so collaborations of artists and activists who would respond to the impact of the pandemic on human rights where they were. Um, the response was huge and we were able to fund projects that used drag performance, murals, theatre, paintings, spoken, spoken word poetry, all kinds of art forms to draw attention to what was happening to human rights. Um, the collaborations covered indigenous rights, socioeconomic rights, responses to rising populism and authoritarianism, the rights of migrant workers, the rights of women, all kinds of socio-economic rights and civil and political rights. So now in a series of activism conversations, what we're seeking to do is to learn from these projects, to understand the new ways of working that evolved in the projects and the role that art can play in the fight for human rights. So um, today's session is on art, activism and the politics of hope, and it's my pleasure to welcome our panellists. First, Nida Ansari and Pooja Dingra, who collaborated on one of the activism projects, Compassion Contagion, and they'll be telling us a bit more about that in the webinar. And also Pooja is now working on another activism project, Manifesto for the Future. So Nida is an activist, development consultant, youth worker and writer who's worked closely with people's movements and been involved in the community-led protests against the Citizens Act. And Pooja is a graphic designer and art director whose work focuses on the issues of discrimination and social exclusion, early and child marriage, women's health, and the rights of adolescent girls. I'm also really pleased to welcome Latasha Badwa, who is a former broadcast journalist and now works as an independent filmmaker, photographer, and writer. Uh, she leads the media team at Kawan e Mohabat, which is a people's campaign for justice, rights, and interfaith harmony. And finally, welcome to Indrajit Roy, who is chairing the panel today. Indrajit is a senior lecturer in global development politics at the University of York and also a member of the Centre for Applied Human Rights. And he's currently researching citizenship and also the politics of hope in India and Europe. So again, welcome to all our panelists, and I will hand over to Indrajit to begin the discussion. 
Thank you, Pippa, and uh, welcome uh, to everyone who's joining us. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, whatever it might be uh, in uh, wherever you're located. Uh, thank you, Pooja, Nida, and Natasha for joining us uh, today, and uh, we're really looking forward to hearing more uh, about you and your work. Uh, it is, of course, a privilege uh, to be uh, called upon to, well, have this conversation with you. So thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Pippa, and the uh, colleagues at uh, CAR for organizing this. Um, without further ado, I'd uh, like to sort of, uh, you know, take us through the uh, conversations and uh, we have, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, things that I'm sure our audience will be very curious to know. So if I could pose uh, to Nida Puja, uh, you know, either of you, whoever wants to take a shot, uh, you know, to tell us a bit more about your activism project. Uh, how it responded to the pandemic, and uh, perhaps also tell us a bit about why you chose to do this. Thank you, Indrajit, for having us on this panel. Really, really nice to meet you, Natasha. Uh, so uh, I would want to show you what we did because our project was really busy. So I'll just take you through the presentation. Can you see my screen? Are you able to see my screen? Not yet. Are you able to see it now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, our project was called Compassion Contagion. Uh, we wanted to uh, document acts of compassion during the time to art, collages, and graphic narratives. Uh, you know, and also focus on invisible activism that kind of uh, happens uh, in the country and which also increased during the pandemic. Uh, so just to give us a little bit of context, you know, when uh, the pandemic hit the country, uh, we were given the entire population of 1.3 billion, uh, was given four hours notice, you know, before the lockdown was announced. And that led to a lot of chaos in the country, you know, uh, people in power completely forgot about, uh, you know, the migrant workers who survive on daily wages, the homeless, the people uh, who did not have access to food without the daily wages, uh, did not have the comfort and safety of their homes. Uh, you know, social distancing doesn't really exist in, in a country like India, you know, where 10 people share a room. Uh, so, so there was a lot of chaos, but uh, what was uh, interesting was how ordinary citizens came out, you know, uh, to, to take care of others, you know, to do whatever they could in the capacity. And that inspired us to uh, work on this project. So what we did was, uh, you know, uh, we divided our project into various themes. Uh, uh, food, food was something that was a basic necessity which a lot of people were denied. And we saw a lot of organizations and individuals uh, cooking for others, you know, cooking meals, uh, some meals extra at home to just give out to people. A large population uh, you know, did not have access to food, and a lot of people had started walking back to the safety of their villages. So, it, so, uh, so it was interesting to talk to these people who we were making sure that they were providing not just nutritious food, but also you know uh, getting dignity, you know, serving people with dignity. So that was one story. Then gender, we wanted to. Uh, Talk about the double impact of uh, the patriarchy as well as the pandemic on women and the LGBTQ community. So we did a story on that. Uh, so also with the pandemic, you know, there was a lot of stress and anxiety uh, in the country, especially uh, you know, in, the, in the poorest of the poor communities or, or with the marginalized communities. Uh, and mental health was something that nobody was talking about, even though India was facing a mental health pandemic along with the virus. So yeah. that is one story. Uh, Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, there's just a bit of feedback. I don't know if there's anything you can do, whether you can move your microphone or anything. It's just, there's a, a little bit of distortion. Is it better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so uh, a lot of pol polarization happened, you know, uh, during the pandemic of uh, a particular religious minority uh, was blamed for the virus. So we spoke to people and uh, individuals and organizations who were trying to build the bridges and trying to work uh, to bring people together, you know. Uh, uh, spirit of volunteerism, animal rights uh, was again, we wanted to talk about how uh, uh, people who hadn't done relief work before were coming out and helping others 
uh, against all odds, you know. Uh, people were getting beaten up or helping others. Uh, they had, uh, since all the shops were shut down, they couldn't procure the essentials. And in spite of that, you know, uh, they were coming out to take care of each other. Animal rights also became Sorry, part of- Pooja. Sorry, I think there's still a bit of feedback. So do you want to just see if there's anything you could do with the uh, uh, mic? Is it, is it better now without the headphones? It is, it is. Okay. Good. Uh, so yeah, so these are some of the uh, themes that we covered uh, with the story. And uh, we told uh, through, through our website, we covered stories of uh, individuals about uh, invisible activism. And we used the medium of art, uh, uh, graphic narratives, and embroidered collages uh, in our work. Uh, since we did a lot of stories, uh, you know, it was important for us to give every story a different visual treatment. Uh, so we landed up working with a lot of, uh, you know, different artists who, who made the project richer with their own diverse skill sets, uh, you know, their art and their creativity. Um, and yeah, so that was our project last year. And this year I'm uh, curating manifesto for the uh, future with, again, you know, uh, uh, a lot of new artists and activities that we are um, collaborating with this year uh, to put this together. Again, uh, you know, the idea of Manifesto for the Future is to shine light on uh, initiatives, grassroots initiatives, or uh, you know, organizations who emerged during the pandemic, the collectives that emerged during the pandemic, who are now showing us you know, new, compassionate, alternative. Uh, way of uh, alternate you know, um, uh, models of development, you know, and so we we are doing a story on the free library movement. We are talking about uh, through one story, we are talking about how people reclaiming food. I mean, the farmers are at the protest right now. You know, it's been going to be ten months of protesting on this on the streets, and here then we are going to talk to people who are kind of not giving in to you know, the corporate owned uh, systems that you know the government wants us to follow. Uh, how do we build uh, better uh, uh, better societies? How do we uh, build compassionate cities? Is one story that we're doing. How do we how do we uh, uh, reclaim the power from the mainstream media? How do we uh, how do we build alternatives in education? Uh, we're also developing a, a, a toolkit, you know, uh, using uh, uh, this ancient form called Kantha, and we're doing the workshop led uh, sessions with communities where people. Uh, can come together and reimagine their futures through stitching and through art and collages. So that's the project that we're doing this year. Also, when the second wave of the pandemic hit, you know, uh, we realized that we want, uh, I mean, there was utter chaos, there was misery, there was grief everywhere. And we wanted to help the people we had interviewed for our stories, you know, because we knew they were doing amazing work. So we decided to do an art aid fundraiser where, again, uh, we used the medium of art, collaborated with various artists to curate works on the themes of uh, compassion, hope, solidarity. Uh, and yeah, that's how we supported a lot of uh, you know, organizations uh, with funds. And we've also, we've, and we've also want to know, you, we've used the medium of poetry and we've combined it with art uh, to uh, do another fundraiser for rural India. Uh, in which we have uh, collaborated with 10 artists and 10 poets to make these postcards with poems on hope, uh, which go out to everybody who donates to the campaign. So yeah, uh, I mean, uh, so if, with everything that we do, uh, all our work, right, from the first phase of the project in our manifesto for the future, to collaborations that are happening now, uh, the idea is to shift the narrative from despair to that of hope. Thank you so much, uh, Pooja, for that uh, overview of your work. Um, and I think it's it's really uh, topical to sort of think about how we might move from despair to hope, uh, you know, uh, uh, using the, uh, or mobilizing the sorts of ideas of compassion and solidarity that you mentioned. Um, although uh, I think audience members found it a little difficult sometimes to get the audio bit, but I think your slides were really very helpful uh, to convey, you know, what exactly you were doing. So, so, so thank you so much for those uh, very engaging slides uh, as well. Um, I wanted to ask uh, if you could reflect on uh, what the partnership between artists, activists and art or uh, activism uh, you know, what this collaboration between art and activism brought to your project that other more typical forms of protest or campaigning uh, couldn't. Um, 
I don't know if uh, Nita or Pooja, who, who you know, who would like to sort of go for it. Thanks. Uh, thanks. It's a real trip down memory lane to see the images uh, from what Pooja and I started last year. And like Pooja shared, uh, you know, uh, the idea of the project was to tell the stories uh, which mainstream media have um, not really covered. You know, uh, we don't really know those stories because, you know, we know communities that are vilified, we, you know, uh, you know, big banners of developmental uh, sort of uh, processes that uh, the government is doing in the name of its people. But we don't know these smaller narratives of really how grassroots communities in the face of scarcity and absolute negligible resources are really surviving and thriving possibly, um, you know, if that's even possible. So that was the idea of our project. And between Pooja and me, uh, storytelling was a fulcrum. Uh, it was a pull for both of us. Um, and, you know, how those stories get depicted is something that we really collaborated on. Um, the idea was not just to put uh, narratives or stories of the efforts that have been taken by communities. Uh, and the efforts were not just in terms of content, but were also in terms of um, how to talk about the unique socio-political identity of a community, you know, and how it impacts how they survive. Uh, especially when it comes to marginalized communities. And then when you transfuse that with art and different varied forms of art, the, the effect is fantastic because what it does to a reader, uh, that visual art form, is draw, it draws you in. Different things uh, draw in different people. And that was our idea, that how can we amplify and highlight these stories as much as possible. Um, to backtrack a little bit, um, as a country in India, we're we're one of the largest democracies in the in the world right now uh, and uh, we're also one of the youngest democracies and also with the largest youth population and uh, you know protest is not something that uh, uh, is alien to us in the his historical uh, in just in the history of our country it's not it's not an alien thing uh, and more so in its recent past um, there has been a coming together uh, as a uh, state uh, state authorized autocracy uh, rises, uh, there is definitely uh, an amalgamation and coming together of various people's movements. Uh, and we've seen that over the last few years, whether it's workers' movements, students' movements, teachers' movements, uh, right for education, right to food, you know, all of that is coming together more and more. And uh, uh, under what circumstances, yes, unfortunate, but there is a need for that. Uh, and uh, the recent protests have been the citizenship protests uh, against CA and NRC, um, you know, uh, in the last one and a half uh, years. And as you know, when the pandemic hit, um, one is that people couldn't physically gather together. So all forms of physical protest had to come to a standstill. Uh, but there was also a deliberate move uh, employed uh, by the government uh, and various authorities uh, to stamp down on any possible trace of these protests. Uh, and well, that's not unique to our country. Uh, it seemed to be happening across the world globally in other countries in South America, for example, in America. Uh, for example, um, you know, graffiti and public art was something that was, was an essential part along with poetry and music as forms of uh, expression to express dissent against these laws uh, in the protest. And that's something that really spoke to me in Puja as well. But like we saw when the pandemic hit and the movements uh, protests were kind of stamped out, uh, these walls where graffiti was created were whitewashed uh, by the police. Uh, and it's, it's very symbolic, uh, that move in itself, uh, the need to whitewash a piece of graffiti. Uh, you know, which told a story uh, about a particular community, about a particular movement. And so that therefore for us, art was very, very important. Uh, we wanted to explore different visual languages. Uh, we, we wanted to bring together our specific backgrounds, our callings, you know, uh, what we're passionate about, you know, uh, social justice, discrimination, gender equality, uh, interfaith work. Uh, these were all different passions that we wanted to bring together. And uh, that's, that's, something that, um, that's something that also enabled us to bring in different people into the project. Uh, we were very keen on that. So we were able to bring in researchers, writers, and artists of different kinds. Like Pooja said, we, we created 11 stories 
um, for the first phase of the project uh, that we did together. And each story uh, was brought to life visually by a different artist. And we were very keen on that because it's not just to give a platform to different artists and their, and their visual art, uh, but also to be able to support people in the time of the pandemic and to share resources. That was really important for us. So yeah, yeah, I think that that's a bit about uh, our collaboration. Thank you, thank you. I think it's 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 really useful to think about you know uh, this sort of uh, partnership and what it brings, um, especially when uh, we don't you often think about art and its role in politics, uh, in in protest politics at least. Um, but uh, but I think that just raises further questions. Uh, you know, how did this happen? How did you know participants in your projects? Uh, actually work together and I wondered if you could sort of uh, I'm sure uh, you know people are curious to know more about the how so if you could tell us a mo bit more uh, please. Pooja if you're speaking we can't hear you you're I think on mute. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes and it might be an idea you know just to sort of be where you are because we can really hear you very <laughs> yeah. Yeah. at this spot. <laughs> Okay, so you know, uh, for the project, we work with a lot of writers, artists, grassroots organizations, and it was quite an amazing experience because uh, we, there were so many people who were collaborating uh, with us. So, uh, but it was also very important for us right from the beginning to uh, keep our approach intersectional, collaborative, participative, and inclusive. And our process, you know, I mean, it was a really wrong process. Uh, it started with uh, research, then interviews, then writing, editing, storyboarding, art directing, illustrating, then putting, putting it all together, you know, on the website, then uh, getting them approved, you know, to whoever we spoke to because we wanted to do justice to the stories. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, we just made sure that our approach was, you know, it, uh, this was understood by everybody who came on board. And, uh, you know, and the, the good thing about our project was that uh, we interviewed and documented uh, stories from all over the country and a team which got formed during the process was also as diverse as the stories. And, uh, and so we worked very closely with everyone. Uh, we had several discussions with them so that, you know, every story that we did uh, could be approached with utmost uh, care and sensitivity. Thank you. Uh, I think it, it's it's a dream, you know, to think about uh, intersectionality and collaboration along the lines that you say. But surely there were, you know, challenges uh, in in this collaboration, and of course there must have been, uh, you know, things to be proud of. So I wondered if you could elaborate a bit on the uh, successes and challenges of your uh, collaboration, uh, perhaps. Yeah, rightly said, Indrajit, there's no dearth of challenges in a project because, um, I mean, look, first of all, um, this is an aspirational project. It was a passion project that we picked up. You know, we wanted to tell these stories. You know, we were lucky and grateful to have gotten the grant that we applied for. And, you know, we just took it from there. But just the sheer number of ways and the number of stories that you can pick up. I mean, the pandemic and COVID was on the face of it. A public health emergency but that's not what it was in a country like India I mean it, sh it kind of it showed the existing cracks in the socio-economic structures of the country so there were so many topics so many ways um, that the story the stories could go the communities the varied communities were being impacted and then and we wanted to tell it all right so there wasn't enough time we, we had to let go of some topics you know, um, we couldn't really do that. We couldn't do justice to it. For example, uh, you know, we had with the limited time and resources and the process as Pooja explained was uh, quite lengthy for each story to treat each story with that entire process with a smaller team. So cast, for example, uh, was something that we were very, very keen uh, to work on, but it's something that we could not get to because we didn't want to do um, just um, a superficial treatment uh, of a piece. We wanted to go in deep. Uh, and so we had to let that go for that particular phase. Um, so that was one idea. The other was um, there was no dearth of content in terms of just facts that so-and-so group has em employed so-and-so effort to combat the pandemic and the various challenges and the hurdles that came from it. Uh, but there's also the, there's a backstory to it. There's a depth to it. You know, who are these people? What's their socio-political location? Uh, does their identity pose any challenge? And how do you, uh, how do you enmesh uh, some of those uh, details into the story? Because 
that's what life is. That's what reality is. It's never separate. It's all together all at once. Uh, so that was something um, that was not easy for us and really needed uh, time, so to speak. Um, everything was electronic, you know, everything was virtual. Um, we would have liked to go and visit some of these communities. We really wanted to, but it just wasn't possible, you know. So, and, and especially when you go more into hinterlands, when you go more into rural areas, I mean, just the way we persuaded people to support their local grassroots workers, to transport them to a center, somehow get on a Zoom or a phone, you know, so somehow we managed the recordings, the interviews, bad sound quality, all of that. Those were very real logistical problems, you know, because that's not uniform across our country. Um, that was one thing. The other was, um, I think, being aware of our own local standpoint uh, and our own privilege. Uh, as cis, het, uh, upper class, privileged uh, women from the city and being aware of the fact that we exist in an echo chamber. You know, uh, if we're writing a story um, on interfaith work, um, who are we really reaching out to? Are we being able to reach out to the right people? Are we being able to reach out to people who are really on the margins of the margins? If we're talking about food poverty or, or um, you know, uh, uh, initiatives towards uh, bridging that gap? Are we looking just at NCR, Bombay, Calcutta, or are we being able to reach out to, uh, you know, a community like the Musahars, which is a, which is a really, really marginalized communities, uh, community, you know, uh, in MP. So that was the idea and much more effort had to be built to do that, you know, reach out to organization, reach out to their members, many more calls had to be put uh, forward for that. So, I mean, those were just some of our challenges, um, you know, uh, but there were lots of successes and, you know, the, it, this is a project that's always very close to me and Pooja's heart, just with a lot of warmth, you know, uh, and I think just the sheer ability to pull off with that process, each story, uh, you know, the number of organizations, you know, as Pooja said, uh, when we got down to it, we realized there were about 150 interviews that we had conducted with over 60 organizations across the country. And we were still not nearly satisfied. I mean, we were never satisfied. You know, we always felt we could have done more, but uh, those were a lot of different voices that we were able to reach out to. Uh, and not just um, your mainstream voices from the developmental sector or NGO, so to speak, but, you know, individuals, uh, you know, your uh, neighborhood auntie, uh, you know, who saw something happening, um, who saw that, you know, the vegetable vendors weren't really being able to make ends meet and just decided to start cooking something extra in our house, you know, uh, you know, or, or girls in the village, you know, who decided to uh, start ferrying vegetables from their local gardens just to make, you know, so sure that their neighbors could get. So, I mean, just smaller incidents like that, that was something that was really, really, we were really happy about. Um, we would have liked to be able to, as I said, make it more participatory, truly, uh, and, uh, you know, go a little deeper, uh, which was we wanted to invite writers to be able to write their story themselves, uh, more collaborations on writing uh, from people from, you know, from the community. Uh, and one such story was really, really close to our heart, uh, to our heart which was um, written by Sandhya, um, who's from a, who's a young person uh, who uh, grew up in um, the sex workers community Kamatipura in Bombay. It's the largest uh, sex workers red light area. Um, and uh, she wrote her own story uh, and that turned into a graphic narrative. And that's something that was really, really close to us uh, because that those were her words, those were her story. And that's the sort of ideal we want to project uh, for future stories um, as well. Um, that was something that was really nice for us. Um, I think uh, because uh, the project is about, was about activism and art together. And um, um, I'm not sure, uh, you know, just the, the mainstream definitions uh, that are flouted around about what is protest and dissent uh, is highly vilified, uh, you know? So to be able to put a more broader understanding that solidarity is not just, uh, you know, two words of appreciation with the marginalized community, but it's about doing the back work. It's about highlighting the practices, the challenges, uh, the, and the labor and the resources and demanding for the resources uh, that go uh, into that work. That's something I, I feel like we were able to bring forward uh, with certain stories. And that was something that I really feel good because um, 
we're always talking about post pandemic i don't really know what is this post pandemic world it's an ongoing loop you know <clears throat> but there is a blueprint there are lessons to be learned if one looks harder i mean lessons could have been learned 20 years ago as well but why not now when something as big as the pandemic has kind of taken over everyone so that was something really beautiful and like i mentioned the visual narratives you know i mean every single story has a different visual language a different style to it uh, which speaks to the story uh, that was something that was really uh, we felt really proud of uh, in being able to support these artists um, and well and yeah we had a we had a humble team of uh, 22 writers researchers artists apart from myself and pooja and you know that was something that that team you know it's kind of like a floaty floating team but you know just being able to work together uh that was something that was really close to us so yeah that that's a little bit uh, that yeah. that's really really very um helpful to know and i think you know when we think about what impact the, you know such interventions have or such projects have you know you talked about the neighborhood aunt or you know people who who ordinary people everyday people you know who who are really touched by 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 this work so that's that's really amazing to know and it's uh, and it's brilliant to actually think beyond your immediate echo chamber as you put it and to you know perhaps engage with those outside of it i'd like to bring natasha into the conversation now if that's okay natasha uh, if you could tell us a bit more about what you chose to focus on uh during the pandemic and 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 why okay so as an individual i'm um, i'm a writer and a filmmaker uh but i've also been part of a campaign called the karwane mohabbat the caravan of love uh for the last 3 years uh and this was a campaign announced by um Uh, you know a much admired uh, activist in india a human rights worker in india called harsh mandar uh, who uh, was a former uh, is officer uh, and in uh, 2019 uh, in 2017 uh, when there began to emerge a pattern of violence uh, all over india where in seemingly unrelated incidents working class muslim men would be attacked uh by mobs sometimes in their own home sometimes near their home sometimes on their way to work uh would be they would be accused of either uh, attacking a cow trying to sell a cow killing a cow or being a beef smuggler and um uh, you know and 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 the violence would be filmed and those videos would begin to go viral so this was a new form uh, of public violence that we began to see and the the pattern that emerged after that would be that the state instead of acting uh, to protect the victim and the victims uh, the survivors of the violence would um, would seem to criminalize the victim himself uh, as if he must have done something wrong to deserve it and seemed Uh, consistently across in- incidents to protect uh, the perpetrators and uh, you know the fact that it would always be a muslim man who would be attacked in mob violence the attackers would almost always be uh, hindutva uh, believers so people who kind of uh, propagate a very uh, violent aggressive form uh, of uh, uh, hindu identity would all, almost always be men and the state would seem to be in collusion this uh, it it you know seemed to a very large number of uh, people uh, civil society people uh, that there was an there was a pattern here that the state was not recognizing or invisibilizing that there was a pattern here that the media was not paying attention to and that this was perhaps a time uh, when it became necessary for uh, individuals to come together and speak up against it so a fair number of writers filmmakers uh, you know they, they were, there were many calls uh, to to create a public campaign against this kind of violence against a community uh, a very large community in this country so not in my name was one of those uh, campaigns another one was karwani mohabbat uh, the caravan of love where we began to visit the homes of um victims 
of mob violence, uh, to offer them solace, uh, to ask for their forgiveness, to hold their hands, to see what kind of legal help, livelihood, support they needed. And as it turned out, a fair number of us were filmmakers, writers, journalists, artists. And uh, it became imperative to then represent uh, these stories in the work we do. And as a columnist, I began to write about it because you know one just felt compelled uh, to, to scream from the rooftops because uh, as Nida said, mainstream media uh, won't cover it. They seem to have their own vested interests or fears and the state seems to be in collusion. Um, within a year uh, and a half, uh, 2019, late 2019, the uh, CAA was announced, the Citizenship Amendment Act, which was a state-sanctioned marginalization, which seemed to be a state-sanctioned marginalization of an entire community of people um, who felt Indian, are Indian, uh, have lived as Indians, uh, you know, and then suddenly their citizenship, the citizenship of um, Muslims uh, was put at stake uh, and, and a huge amount of insecurity was created. And, and like we all saw here in India, it, it seemed to just collectively touch a raw nerve. And, and we saw a, a large number of protests emerge, uh, very, very creative uh, protests emerge. Many, many first time protesters, many elderly people protesting for the first time, the student community across this country, across universities, uh, sitting in defiance of uh, university rules, or in defiance of the police, um, people working in different fields, activists from different fields, everybody kind of coming together. It culminated in the violence that took place in Delhi in February 2020. And in March 2020, when we were a large number of people uh, and uh, individuals were, you know, scrambling across the world to try to provide relief to those people who had been victimized by the violence in Northeast Delhi, um, uh, you know, which many, many writers have called a pogrom because it was targeted and it was, um, it, it, it was in collusion with the state. We saw policemen standing by allowing mobs to attack uh, Muslim um, shops, homes, uh, uh, you know, and Muslim people. And while there were, you know, we were still working in relief camps and trying to figure out how the protest sites should respond. And, um, uh, you know, the, the lockdown was announced, the pandemic became a thing. And as uh, Pooja shared, it, it, it was announced with a four R, um, you know, uh, period. We were told at eight at night that after 12, nobody could move from where they were. Students were stuck in hostels. Um, families were, um, you know, wherever they were, people were stuck together, buses stopped. And of course, within days, what we saw was, um, again, Nida, Nida touched upon that, not a medical crisis, but a humanitarian crisis of a proportion that really literally India has not witnessed since its independence in 1947. We had mass hunger because uh, India's working poor, India's migrant labor, India's daily wage uh, workers, India's uh, you know, uh, uh, small and medium industry workers were suddenly had no wages. They had no access to the places where they lived or stayed. Many of them stayed in their workplaces. Uh, they were rendered homeless overnight without access to food. All the small eateries where they would have got food were shut down. And the police came after the poor as if they were the cause of the pandemic. So we saw the hunger crisis. Then we saw the migrant labor crisis when people, it was beyond our imagination when it began to happen, but it did happen. Uh, over months, we had people walking across the length and breadth of this vast country, trying to reach um, their homes in their, uh, you know, because they, they saw no other way. Many people died on the way. Many people died after reaching. It was extremely traumatic and, and distressing even to witness, leave alone, uh, to have to have lived through. 
And in that scenario, um, you know, a lot of us um, uh, privileged people, people who, whose personal lives were not at stake, uh, you know, we, we were not uh, without food or homes or income, but, but we were witness to this. And, and there was a sudden realization about how much our lives were intertwined with the migrant workers in this country, um, my driver, my gardener, my uh, the woman who works in my house, uh, uh, you know, the uh, people who work in the market uh, that I go to every day, all of them, all of them like beggars on the street suddenly. So they, it became absolutely imperative. It was an emergency. We needed to respond. And it really was simultaneously a moment of great trauma as well as a time for action and a time for coming together in hope. Um, because what we saw uh, in India was a huge amount of support coming um, uh, via social media, via the internet from every corner of the world. You know, there, people were uh, immediately writing in to say, where can we donate? Who is going out there? Uh, and as the the, the campaign, the Karwani Mohabbat has always been, it, you know, it's been a grassroots level campaign. It's always worked with the people who are themselves the victim and taken the responsibility to tell their story through, through films. And, and that's, you know, where I kind of come in because that's, uh, I, I lead the media team that makes those short films. And um, our, our, you know, our, um, the, the hope, I mean, <laughs> in capital letters with which we do this work is, you know, you make a film and you just put it out there. You just put it on every single platform, every single medium, you let it go through the WhatsApp channels uh, because it must go beyond, uh, you know, your, your own circles. And it's, the, it's a, the story must travel, the story must outreach. It must inspire those uh, whom it can reach because that's what will bring in more and more people to join the action that needs to be done. And um, that, that really was, um, it, it, was a, it was a moment when we were releasing a film every day, um, wherever we were going to distribute food, uh, you know, as a collective, we were also filming testimonies, we were editing them overnight, putting them out, and those were then bringing in, uh, helping to bring in the kind of uh, crowdfunding that supported uh, you know, th this, um, the, the hunger uh, solidarity work that many, many organizations and individuals came together to do. So it really was uh, and, and continues to be a time. Uh, we've just about come through the second wave. Uh, we've, you know, politics and personal lives are heavily intertwined in India. While uh, we were, uh, you know, ourselves ill with, with the COVID virus this year, our own family members were scrambling to find a hospital bed. We were having elections in Bengal. Uh, with the prime minister himself, uh, you know, creating these um, uh, huge uh, uh, boasting about the crowds that were coming, irrespective of the fact that there's a pandemic. We were having the Kum Mela, again, sponsored by the state, the largest gathering of humans on earth, dipping in, in water. And uh, it, it just, uh, it's a very dynamic time in a sense. So most of us, we find that whatever we know how to do, we must use that to contribute to the narrative that we want to emerge out of these times. And to that end, uh, it, it, I mean, sometimes my children are like, but I, didn't you join for a short time? When is this going to get over? When are you coming back? And, and we just realized that we're, this is a long term, um, you know, where we are going to dedicate a large part of our lives now to the restoration of, democracy and solidarity and uh, some kind of equity, mm -hmm. social and political equity in, in the society that we live in. Thanks, uh, Natasha. I mean, I think it's, it's really, uh, uh, you know, poignant in some ways to think about these circumstances that, uh, you know, entwine the personal with the political. Uh, and, and these, are, of course, 
are uh, interesting times in every sense of the term, uh, which uh, you know makes it impossible for, I suppose, people whose lives may not be directly touched, but then of course are at the same time touched. Uh, you know, so it's 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 that paradox. Um, uh, I suppose in ways that does not even leave privileged people untouched, uh, if not in in the ways you know uh, that you would have expected earlier, but you know does sort of make it a imperative uh, for people to act. I mean, I, I, I and in in some ways this you know sort of brings me to uh, you know thinking about um, you know these are interesting times, these are terrifying times in some ways, uh, in the ways that uh, you know all of you've. Uh, suggested, and I wondered, you know, what uh, you, you understand, how your, you know, what you understand hope uh, as in in these uh, terrifying and interesting times. Uh, you know, you've you've already in some ways pointed Natasha to uh, solidarity, to equity, um, but I wondered if uh, you know, Nida Puja, you had any further thoughts on what uh, hope might mean for you. In, in such uh, terrifying times. If you could just sort of, you know, give us a few very brief, because we're running out of time as well, you know, but very brief um, idea of your experience of hope uh, during the pandemic when everything seemed to be so hopeless in, 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 in some ways. So I don't know, uh, you know, who, who wants to go, go first yet? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think it simply just means, I mean, uh, it just means to not giving into despair, not getting defeated, getting out every day and uh, you know, doing whatever little you could, you can do. I mean, even uh, smaller actions count, you know, I mean, and smaller actions uh, lead to bigger things is what we have realized because that's what we saw, you know, ordinary people willing to confront despair, risking their lives, coming out, raising funds, uh, daughters, young girls fighting their fathers, uh, young girls fighting their husbands to come out and help others, becoming community leaders, you know, and uh, building networks, building solidarity. This is, that is so hopeful because these are the solidarities that are now going to, you know, uh, shift the narrative. They are going to change things around in the country. So, yeah, that's what we saw, you know, during the first wave, during the sec second wave, the kind of hopelessness we saw. And in spite of that, uh, uh, you know, few people then uh, becoming collectives uh, gives us a lot of hope. Thanks, Pooja. I mean, I suppose it's it's that old adage, isn't it? Out of crisis, there emerges hope, and in a sense, the two, in 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 uh, paradoxical and some would say even perverse ways, actually feed into uh, one another. Uh, Nida, I wondered if you had any any anything to add on that. Uh, yeah, I think um... <coughs> briefly. Oh, I, yeah, very very briefly. I I I I'll, I'll be very very brief. Uh, solidarity, hope. Um, one way that we found was putting words and narratives and writings out there. But the other was also putting practices, uh, tools, uh, techniques that have been employed by community members and also being able to uh, advocate for a decentralized model of resource support. Uh, because that is what we saw in India when, um, when, when, uh, when the civil society came together, when grassroots activists came together, to support the little guy. I think that is what came to my mind more and more in solidarity and hope. And I mean, there's a lot of politics and uh, there's a lot of national politics towards uh, where does the money go? How do resources get shared or supported? I'm not going to talk much, but what we've realized is how does it trickle down? Does it even trickle down? And so what can we do to help amplify the need to trickle it down? Uh, you know, because it is our responsibility uh, at the end of the day, uh, different sections and identity groups and marginalized groups. If uh, if those roles were not played, some of us could not live comfortably in our buildings, in our homes. Uh, and that is the reality. And I think being grateful for that and learning how to live in that symbiotic way in an everyday lifestyle and an everyday fashion. You start with your home, you start with your own, uh, you, you start with your own employees, you start with your own domestic workers, the vegetable vendor in front of your house, you know, in your own locality, in your own neighbor and you branch out from that. You know, everyday actions that are doable. Uh, it doesn't need to be huge. It doesn't need to be big. It just needs to be sustainable. Yeah, yeah I think it's it's really, um, you know, I, I like the way both uh, you and Pooja have, you know, talked about you know, the everyday sorts of ways in which one can think about hope. The small actions, uh, you know, that, that, that really push the idea of hope. 
and the envelope, so to speak, on hope. And, um, you know, it doesn't have to be grand ideas, uh, so to speak. It, it doesn't have to be grand plans or projects. Uh, and in some ways, I suppose, you know, hope is what we are left with when uh, utopias die, you know, when these big projects of trying to re-engineer society, uh, they don't work or they come with their own challenges, their own devastations. And, you know, what you then are left with are these small uh, scale sorts of actions which, uh, or ideas which really push, uh, push the envelope on hope. Um, Natasha, since you talked about, you know, the, the politics of anger, of fear, of hatred that started off Karwan e Mohabbat, as well as your own involvement in it, um, do you have any thoughts on uh, how hope can change the way society can be organized to counter these uh, ideas, these, you know, these emotions of anger, fear or hatred, or, or, or is it a lost cause? Just very quickly, some thoughts. I have to say very quickly because we have 10 minutes left and I do have another question I want to ask. So you'll have to be really quick. So thankfully, history teaches us that it's never a lost cause. Right. So just like history shows us, uh, I mean, none of us, uh, we're all more or less the same generation, maybe 10, 15 years here or there. <laughs> but none of us grew up imagining that uh, we would be living through the times that we are living through not only the pandemic, which has upended the way the world functions, but also the collapse of governance, the collapse of democracies, um, you know, the, 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 the rise of uh, a kind of right-wing politics and fascism in the uh, 20th century. Uh, we, I mean, we, we grew up with hope, uh, knowing that, you know, the worst was over and it was only gonna get better, but that's not the reality we're living in today. So while, uh, you know, um, uh, we, we, we kind of eat humble pie and realize that what has happened before will happen again unless, uh, you know, we put more and more checks and balances in the way and unless um, individual people choose to participate to create, you, you can never be passive, you can never take things for granted. Uh, and, and literally, we're all in it for ourselves, you know, for each one of us is, is threatened, it's our own humanity our own sense of being um, a, a human being that, that you know, feels a sense of loss. And uh, that, that's what kind of propels you to act because what is it that I can do to get out of this despair because I cannot go to bed and wake up the next morning feeling that all is lost. I, I have to find a way to feel better and action is hope, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, literally, you know. Thanks. Action is hope. Yeah, that's uh, if someone were tweeting, that's one of those things we would probably put out there. Um, last question to all of you before I hand back to Pippa. Um, so, you know, there's, of course, uh, difficult times, terrifying times, and there is uh, these sort of, you know, ideas about hope. And there's the sort of work that you've done uh, on art, you know, that brings art together with politics. So if in a couple of sentences, you know, each of you would reflect on what role art plays in pushing forward the politics of hope. Um, I think that would be something we'd like to, you know, uh, have your final word on. So I don't know who wants to go first. Um, you know, what role does art play in the politics of hope? Pooja, please. I think uh, sometimes you forget that the most important role of art is to comfort and to heal us. And if uh, self and collective healing happens on a larger scale, you know, even if, if, the, if the people in power they 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 you know use the power of art, I think uh, the world will be more hopeful. And uh, also, we have seen how art has brought people together. Sorry, the, the side, uh, during protests, you know, poets and uh, and and the religious space, and that's why they are always after. Uh, they want to just lock us all up, you know, sending us uh, to prison. So, uh, so they because they know the, the power of collectivization, you know, that uh, that art has, and also you know something like uh, and it unites us. Uh, from here, I mean, Aziz, uh, you know, he sang a poet during the protest, and it turned and it resonated with so many, and that's what it does. You know, art makes us forget boundaries. It 
rights us against oppression. That's I think the role that it plays. Thanks. Um, we lost you at times, but I think the most important message we got was art unites against uh, borders. So I think that's that's a message to sort of really, uh, you know, take uh, forward. Nida, did you want to add anything to that? please? Yeah, I mean, just a few words. I think, look, uh, as Natasha said, uh, fascism and neo-fascism is definitely on the rise. And uh, if fascist forces, uh, which are omnipresent, let's face it, they have more resource, more power, uh, you know, to stamp out um, any action, uh, to stamp out and change narratives, not just of the present, but as we're seeing also of the past, uh, you know, uh, history is changing as we see it. Uh, so the power of art that we have with us is we have to constantly work out creative and it may sound uh, very simplistic, but uh, art has that ability to be able to challenge narratives and best fascism to a certain degree uh, with being creative. Uh, it has the ability to go viral, to break boundaries, um, you know, open up definitions and to really unite communities. Um, it has the ability to draw in many, many more people uh, than simple words or actions could. And art is important. It is such an important tool of documentation because to document the present uh, is, is the real dissent here because our, our, most of us are not being allowed to do that even uh, you know who will remember the story of today you know who stood up who didn't and what did we stand up for uh, and I think art has that role uh, you know to be able to really keep that together. Mm. I suppose yes you're uh, you know in a simple way chronicling the present uh, which itself becomes then an act of dissent as you very correctly say thank you Nida. Natasha, in, in, in some ways, really the last word. <laughs> but of course, Pippa will have the last word. But Natasha, if you have anything you want to add, please. Yeah, no, uh, really, uh, each one of us is an artist. Uh, you know, we, we have to reclaim. Uh, many of us lose that sense uh, through years of schooling. But uh, we have to reclaim uh, our inner artist, our inner creator. You know, whether we're growing uh, vegetables in our backyard or uh, feeding the cats in the street. Uh, you know, all of these actions or, or creating something that is like more mainstream artistic uh, or, or wins us an award or some recognition. Each one of these things, it, it heals. And, and, I, and, you know, that, and I think in the first slides that Pooja shared, um, there were little snippets of small acts of healing that are part of the art that a human being has the power to create. We are never passive. You put us in any corner, uh, any one of us, and we will find our way out. And it is our inner artist who will be that uh, you know, spark of light that will lead, lead you out of there. Uh, so it heals, it challenges uh, those in power, it gives us a voice, it communicates. I mean, I think it, it really is what uh, makes the individual human being so powerful and what brings us together as collectives, as societies, what has brought us all together today as well. Thank you, uh, you know, for reminding us of the power to heal, so to speak, of art. I think, uh, as always, Natasha, your uh, you know, very insightful words. I should have said earlier, uh, Natasha is a co-investigator with us um, on the uh, Reimagining Citizenship Research Consortium. So in a sense, I've learned a great deal from Natasha and her insights, uh, and today was no exception. Um, but uh, I want to uh, thank uh, all three of you. Uh, all good times have to come to an end, and so must this hour. So thank you, Pooja. Thank you, Nida. Thank you, Natasha, for your time and your insights and all the sort of work that you've done over the last uh, uh, several years. I mean, it's easy to be hopeless and to you know be in despair at these times and, and and a lot of it is justified I mean you know trust me we don't want to buy into these narratives of optimism of aspiration that our governments would want us to you know uh, buy uh, whether in India whether in Britain whether in Brazil wherever else um, so I think it's useful to push back against that narrative but also useful and important not to fall into despair. And I think the way in which you help us to think about hope beyond these two 
uh, extremes uh, and these two uh, polar sort of views, I think is really, really uh, empowering as, uh, as somebody has put in the chat box. So thank you so much uh, for your time. Thank you to everyone who's been, uh, who uh, signed in to listen to uh, uh, these three very, uh, very, very powerful and inspiring figures. Um, I want to now uh, hand back to Pippa and thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Indrajit, for chairing the discussion today. And thank you for a, a great summary. It's been really inspiring listening to all of you. Thank you, Natasha, Nida, and Pooja. And there's some, as Indrajit said, there's um, a comment there saying how empowering your, uh, your um, speaking was. And I think that's, it's just been so nice to hear about, despite the humanitarian crisis in India, to hear about your projects that have used art, your projects of compassion, love, and hope. and. I think um, I'm going to remember what Natasha said about action is hope. That was that's a great thing to take away from this. So we we are out of time. As Indrajit said, thank you all for joining us. I hope you can come to the next webinar we have. And thank you again to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.